Yes, God bless each and every one of you. What a blessing, what a privilege, what an honor it is for us to be able to share together uh, the unsearchable riches of the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. We're going to share with you for just a few minutes tonight. Normally, we have videos of preaching that are playing, but the Bible lets us know to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so tonight, this is a night and this is a day of celebration of the life of my late wife, Lady Rachel L. Hankerson, who would have been 49 years old if she remained in this life. Uh, but tonight we want to focus on some great lessons that emanate from her life versus just uh, focusing on her death. And so it's a privilege to be here with you. I do ask that you would please hit that share button like so many of us are doing, like I'm doing right now, as we share with you the things that God has placed upon our heart and our spirit to share with the people of God. We're going to pray and go directly into what God has for us tonight. Uh, as you can see from the lesson title, we have a wonderful lesson entitled Life Lessons, Life Lessons, Love, Marriage, Sex, and grief. And we're going to base all of this on the word of God. I believe anything that you share, it must be based upon the word of God. And so again, it is a privilege to be able to share with you. Let's pray and go directly into what God would share with us tonight. Please note that as we pray and as we go into the lesson, I'm not on the normal app that I'm on that uh, is able to list all of the various scriptures before you on the screen, but I see a Deacon Colts and Deacon Colts is able to uh, share with us and place that on the screen, but I will give you the reference in where we are talking from. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this golden and blessed and magnificent opportunity that you have afforded us to come together and discuss things regarding your kingdom, regarding life in your kingdom, regarding life as a believer. We thank you right now for this golden opportunity that we have to share your unsearchable riches. Now, bless the people of God now as we converge together and hear what you would say to us, we ask it all in Jesus' name and let all the people of God say amen. God bless you. This almost reminds me of YPWW years ago. I'm known as a uh, evangelistic preacher and, of course, being the former president of evangelism for the Church of God in Christ. But I believe that all of us started out in the youth department, regardless of whether you are uh, Church of God in Christ, regardless of whether you're Baptist, Methodist, whatever faith that you may be, all of us started within uh, the realm of the youth ministry. And with that in mind, let's do our letters that we would do in YPWWC. Christ is the answer, Acts 4 and 12. Yes. Oh, occupy till I come. Luke chapter 19, verse 13. G, grow in grace, 2 Peter 3, 18. I, in all thy ways, acknowledge him, Proverbs 3 and 6, and C, cleave to that which is good, Romans 12 and 9. We also would give our pledge. We pledge our unselfish devotion and loyalty to the principles and doctrine of our cogic faith to be representatives of holiness in our everyday life and to let our lives be the mirror that reflects the image of Christ. I read that not only for nostalgia, but I read that because it is important that we recognize that there is a life that we are to live. It's wonderful to dance. It's wonderful to worship. It's wonderful to preach. It's wonderful to serve. It's wonderful this time of year, even to minister to those that are less fortunate. However, God does require a life of us. Now, of course, just living a moral life does not give you or guarantee you a place in heaven. It's nothing but by the grace of God that we are saved. The Bible teaches us in the book of Ephesians that we are not saved by works, but we are saved by grace through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, praise the Lord, all of you. God bless you. Um, but nevertheless, once the Lord saves us, he does require a life. And many times it takes teaching. We can tell people, listen, you're supposed to be this way. You're supposed to be like this. But it's important that we take time from the word of God to explain to God's people uh, how we are to live, how we are to live this life. And so let's get into this tonight. We do ask that you would please uh, follow, like, share, and subscribe as we share with you what God has given us tonight. Again, the life lessons is dealing with love, marriage, sex, and grief. And the bulk of this comes from, obviously, the scriptures, 
but also from uh, the life of my late wife, who I was married to for close to 24 years. We didn't quite make 24, but um, I thank God for her. Uh, please understand that I don't believe in um, eternity or when we pass from this life to the next that we would be concerned about something as mundane as a earthly uh, birthday. But nevertheless, we can use these times to be able to memorialize and celebrate the life of an individual and, of course, the, um, you could say, contributions that they have made to us. So let's deal with love, first of all. Let's deal with love. The Bible says in Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 6, how fair and how pleasant art thou, O love for delights. At one time, those that were uh, determining what would be the canon or the official list of scriptures um, were concerned about the Song of Solomon because it appeared uh, simply very sensuous, and they were trying to figure out what does this have to do with the Holy Writ, what does this have to do um, with our relationship with God, but I believe it is very important that if a person enters into a marriage relationship that there is love. Let me say this to all married couples that God has joined together, and of course I say that specifically for a reason, um, if you don't have that love for each other, ask God to give it to you. Matthew 7 and 7 says, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will come open. In this time that we're in, there are so many people um, that are really selfish. They get into a marital relationship for what they can get out of it. But I can tell you that Lady Rachel Hankerson was the type of individual. She was in it for what she could give. And love was very important to her. And I believe there's a song that's not found in the Kojic hymnal, but it says, love will keep us together. Have I got a witness? So love is the thing that keeps individuals together. Now, when we think of love, we think of it to mean a warm, fuzzy feeling or romance or sensuousness. But when you study the word love from a scriptural perspective, I know we did with the Greek, um, agape and phileo, and um, eros. Nevertheless, when you look at the word love in Hebrew, uh, what we would refer to as the Old Testament, it comes from a word uh, hesed, which literally means loyalty or faithfulness. And that's what keeps a marriage relationship together, not just the sensuousness, not just the uh, romantic, uh, being romantic, but faithfulness, devotion, and loyalty. So it's so important. My wife and I uh, took our marriage vows very seriously. Marriage vows were very important to Lady Rachel Hankerson. Some may, someone may say, well, that's not even found in the Bible. Okay, yeah, brushing your teeth is not found in the Bible, but you need to brush your teeth or else your breath would be so offensive that no one would be able to stand you. Uh, taking a bath is not found in the Bible in the sense of getting some uh, soap and getting in a shower per se. Uh, or taking a bath in the sense of having a bathtub and things as we have now uh, with modern day plumbing and conveniences. But nevertheless, we do it because if you don't do it, it'll be like the old people used to say, they would say, I hear you. And when they said, I hear you, they were meaning that you smell so bad uh, that your aroma is taking over the room. And so nevertheless, everything that we do may not be found and spelled out in scripture specifically, but I believe the marriage vows are very important. And so we took and she took those uh, marriage vows very seriously for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, forsaking all others for them alone till death do us part. Not till they get on your nerves because two individuals that come into the same household, you're going to get on each and other's nerves in one way or the other. That's going to happen. That is a natural thing that is going to happen. You're not going to agree all the time. You're not going to agree with yourself all the time. How many you have ever made a decision and you say, why is it that I uh, did that? So you don't always agree with yourself, but nevertheless, that commitment should be there. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 14 says, turn, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I'm married unto you and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. So God in the book of Jeremiah, as he's talking to the southern kingdom of Judah, which um, which is about to happen, there's about to be an invasion from Babylon. The nation is literally about to be destroyed. The nation is literally about to uh, 
uh, be annihilated by a foreign power. And God is warning the people through the prophet Jeremiah using the uh, symbolism of marriage and saying, I am committed to you. I am married to you. And so again, this is something from my late wife's life. This is something that we just um, experienced, we took seriously, and that is love. When we first got together as a couple and got engaged, uh, that was a question she asked, are you in love with me? Or are you infatuated with me? You see, that's important because there are so many people that are just in love with the idea of being married. Clap your hands, thank you, Sam, because the Lord just said something to you. There's a lot of people just in love with the idea of being married. And for various reasons, maybe because they don't want to be embarrassed. People are asking, are you still single? No one wants you. Um, perhaps it's to show off uh, the ring uh, that you have, the engagement ring. And then, of course, you have the ring. You're infatuated with being married. The marriage ceremony, you spend thousands upon thousands of dollars upon a uh, marriage ceremony for a marriage that lasts only a few weeks. That's infatuation and not love. So love is very important. And again, from the biblical sense, love means loyalty, devotion, and faithfulness. Yes, there are some barriers that have to be uh, placed up. There are some uh, principles that are uncompromised that you must have in a marital relationship. And Lady Hangerson and I, we had those things that were not up for compromise. Going outside of the marriage uh, was not up for any type of compromise. That was not going to happen. And I thank God. And, and I don't say this in a sense trying to make people feel bad, but everybody has their testimony. We have our testimony. People have the testimony that, hey, I was a Casanova. I ran the streets or I was this and that and the other. Um, you know, nevertheless, God forgave me. That's wonderful. But there's other people that have the testimony that God kept them from that. And so God kept the wife and I from it. Why is that? Because we were better than everybody else. God forbid, we're, we're not better than everybody else. And of course, I may kind of move back and forth from talking about uh, my wife in a past tense, current tense. You must understand she still exists just in a different place. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We know as believers, and thank God, thank you, Jesus, that I'm able to talk about this without uh, breaking down, of course, if I go in a different direction and that starts to happen. I know how to cut the camera, but nevertheless, thank God that I'm able to share this with you because, again, absent from the body, but she is definitely present with the Lord. So she still, uh, still is in existence. But most of our life, that was my first and only girlfriend. This is what a lot of people don't know. That was my first and only girlfriend. We uh, were the only ones that knew each other, knew from the biblical sense. And so you can see now, because I think that some people have um, come up under the thought that, well, this was just a phase Hankerson was in, or this is just a show. This is just something that he was... Um, just putting forth so the public can think a certain way. But now that things have gone on for uh, so long, people are like, okay, yeah, you all really were committed to each other. Yes, definitely. No, know what you're asking for. When you get into a marriage relationship and you say, well, I want somebody that loves God just like I do or loves God more than me. Let, let, let me talk about that. Let me talk about that. Because there's people that will say, let me tell you about my wife. She didn't give me any trouble whatsoever. Thank you, you just talking. It wasn't, you know, she didn't give me any trouble whatsoever about ministry or about service to God. If I said I need, I'm going to the uh, church to work, I didn't have any issues or trouble with that. Many times people will say, and it could be that for many of you, um, God may be holding you back from getting what you're asking for because you don't realize what you're asking for. When you say, and that's one thing that she had on her list. We all have our various lists. And I had a mental list. She had a list written down and literally wrote a letter to God. And she wrote that letter to God and said, here's what I want in a husband. And she placed that before the Lord. And then the Lord showed her me and she said, not so. This is Satan, the Lord. This is not God, this old fashioned man that was always just in black and brown and gray and old school. And back in those days, you know, I mean, there was no such thing, 
no hasaba, no such thing wearing pants and lipstick and fingernail polish. I remember one time my grandmother was getting ready to come to church and had some fingernails. I said, no, nah, abasa, you can't, you can't come up in here with that. You have to take that off. She said, surely not, God, this cannot be. But guess what? You grow together. You grow together. And so uh, she had that before God. And one of the things that she said was, I want somebody that loves you. Understand this. There's people that say, I want my spouse to be saved. I want my spouse to be saved. Perhaps you're married to someone that's not saved and you want them to be saved, but you're half stepping and they get saved and get on fire for God. What? We going to where tonight? Bible study. I thought we were going to the movie to see Avatar. And you mean that Bible study? You must be crazy. We're going here to do this and to the convention of revival. Wait a minute. This was a night we were supposed to go to the lake. Well, listen, you prayed and you said you wanted God to send you somebody that loves him more than anything else. Well, Hankerson, it's not him going to the house of God and all that. And I've seen it where people give their spouse all kind of grief to the point that the spouse says, you know what, forget it if I got to deal with this. And speaking of marriage, let's go into that. Speaking of marriage, you build your house, male and female, you build your house as a place of refuge. And I thank God that together, the wife and I built a home, not just a building, but a home that is a refuge. Even to this day, you ask our kids, where you want to go? You want to go here? Want to go there? You want to go home? You know, if you have a place that um, is not a refuge, you want to avoid that as much as possible. And so I've seen situations where people are so, um, what's the word I want to say that's real nice? Hadeish? Is that a word? Hadeish? Some of you can type the, the way to actually say it. So Hadeish at home that, uh, well, the, the, the caption is trying to spell it out here, but are so Hadeish at home until the other spouse is like, you know what? I don't even want to come home. Let me, um, Hankerson, is there something going on at the church tonight? You know, no, there's nothing. You don't have nothing. Is there a revival? Is there a business meeting or something where I can avoid all of this confusion and chaos? Well, here's what Proverbs 5.15 says. Drink waters out of thine own, own cistern, running waters out of thine own well. Amplified says it this way. Drink water from your own cistern of a pure marriage relationship and fresh running water from your own well. I had a wife that was not only very feminine and um she wouldn't <laughs> I, I wouldn't have to come home hey who what are you doing you know no, i didn't have nothing like that so well hankerson sometimes folks can't uh help how their voice is i do understand that i do understand that but it was very distinct in our household who the man and who the woman was well, i just believe it there is no male and i understand that but in a house in a house, I'm talking Bible now. Well, the Bible said there is no male. Yeah, in Christ, there is no male and female. But the Bible says that he made them male and female. And what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. So my wife knew how to be dainty and ladylike, as well as anointed, and how to work hard at the same time. And so it's important, whether you're the husband or wife, that you give 100%. It wasn't what can we get out of it, but what can we put into it? And thank God that my wife never had to worry about, you know, whether this was going to be paid. That, that was for me to handle. I was raised old school. You provide for you. Now, you may not be able to give them a sirloin steak. Uh, you may not be able to give them, uh, well, not sirloin. What's the one? Porter, a porterhouse steak uh, from... Um, What's the name of that fancy steak restaurant? A lot of people like going to. Well, you know what it is, what it is. But maybe it's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But make the best peanut butter and jelly sandwich that you can make for your spouse. That's how I was taught by the late great Bishop T. L. Westbrook. You know, those are not my kids. Those are your kids. You're the one that had those kids with your wife. So you take care of them. You take care of that family. And so thank God for that old teaching. My wife was raised up and trained up in a very traditional uh, church, the Evangelist Center, Church of God in Christ, under the late Elder W.B. Laird, later on, pastored currently by uh, Pastor Leon Stewart. 
uh, but Mother Thelma McCain and Elder John McCain we were married for many, many, many years. Elder McCain, my wife's uh, father, passed away only a few weeks after um, we buried my wife, buried her physical body. But nevertheless, they instilled a strong work ethic in their children. They instilled a great sense of independence because there should be a certain sense of dependence in a family. And, and, and the reason why I say that, you don't want a person to feel like you, you don't need them. Lady Hangerson never made me feel like, man, I don't, I don't need you. I mean, I knew that. I knew that she could make it on her own if necessary. And, and she knew that I could make it on my own if necessary. But you weren't made to feel like, you know, you're not necessary. Nothing that you do matters. You know, she would tell people, hey, this is a great provider. She was a tremendous cheerleader. And sometimes that's what a man needs. And uh, thank God that she was all of that. But that came from her training. A lot of people nowadays just don't have training. They, they would do better, but there is no training. And sometimes in church, I'm just going to be honest, sometimes in church, um, I love and thank God for um, times of praising and magnifying God. I, I'm a preacher that hoops. I mean, I hoop. I'm going to tune up and put my hand behind my ear and all of that. But if you notice, um, I'm not always preaching. There's teaching. Sometimes we have to stop screaming. And some people, that's all they're doing is screaming. Even if they are uh, calling themselves preaching, there's nothing but sometimes a lot of uh, screaming and gymnastics. You know, you go throwing, don't want to knock things out, throwing your foot across the pulpit and walk in the pews and all of that kind of thing. And yeah, I, I've jumped up on chairs before and all that, not all the time. But, um, you know, come on, it comes a time you, you, you just don't do that all the time. You may get caught up and, and jump up on a chair or something like that. But um, yeah, I remember I was coming up and there's this preacher that did that, jumped up on his briefcase and then fell down. I almost broke his neck and fell down. You see, when you do that, you're just clowning. And clowning may entertain the people, but it's not going to train the people. That's good. That, ma that matches. So that's a rhyme. Uh, uh, clowning may entertain the people, but it's not going to train the people. There's teaching and then there's training. That's all necessary. Teaching, training, and whether people like it or not, indoctrination is very important. You know, what, what are we supposed to believe that is sound? The Bible says, speak those things that concern sound doctrine. And uh, sound doctrine was instilled in my wife. So she knew how to get up behind the pulpit and do what was necessary and minister and work the altar. And she knew how to come home and, and fry up some salmon croquettes and rice like nobody's business. Of course, my mother-in-law goes back and forth with that. Well, she got the recipe for me, she said. But nevertheless, she knew how to do that. And at times, remember this, Pastor Pope, the vows say for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, and sickness and health. One time she was so angry at me. She was so angry at me. She said, you did that on purpose. I was having some stomach issues. And uh, for some reason, I said, let me take some vinegar and, and drink the vinegar. I drank the vinegar, got to the bedroom, fell out on the bed and everything. And she said, your dirty self you did that on purpose. I'm just laying. She said, then you're going to lay down in the stuff. What's wrong with I was that sick. I felt that bad. You know, my wife came and cleaned up everything. You know, so she knew how to do that. What does that mean? You're giving 100 percent. John F. Kennedy said, not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And many times people join churches. Many times people get in marriages. Many times people get in friendships for what I can get out of it. But can I tell you something? The reason I'm making it now and have not had the nervous breakdown because people said he's lost his mind. He has literally lost his mind. Watch what you say about people, too. Because some of the people talking about he lost his mind. They're dealing with some things right now that, uh, yeah, so you got to be careful. Those words come back to haunt you. But people say he, he, he's lost his mind. He's just going, 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 going. But let me tell you what. Here's what I've learned. I've learned this by experience. The way to gain strength, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, to gain strength is to help somebody else that's broken to help somebody else that's wounded, to help somebody else that's going through. And uh, Minister Warlick has a song that he, he sung it last week. As I minister to you, I felt that, I minister 
to myself. Yeah, sometimes you have to encourage yourself. But think about that. As I minister to you, I minister to myself. Someplace I went and someone told me, said, Hankerson, my God, you just preached to what I said. Listen, I was preaching to myself and I was just allowing you all to listen in. So it's very important that we have that sound doctrine and teaching. You mothers that are watching, you, you fathers that are watching, you have experience. You Well, Hankerson, I didn't have what you had. I, woo. One person told me, said, Hankerson, you sad because your, your spouse is in the, your wife is in the cemetery. The guy told me, said, I wish mine was. I said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself talking like that. But there's people that talk like that and they've gone through things, gone through divorces. You can share with people not only what to do, but what not to do. So everybody has something to offer. And you may say, people don't want to hear what I have to say. No, someone wants to hear what you have to say. All the trouble people are going through now. So we need sound doctrine, teaching, training, instruction, and indoctrination. And speaking of that, as I go to Ephesians chapter 5, 20 through 23, now there's this saying now where people talk about being a king and being a queen. I, I, so-and-so is a queen. So-and-so. You, you know what? In our household, you had to earn the right to be king or queen. I'm going to Ephesians chapter 5. Lady Hankerson gave me the right to be the head of my household. She allowed me to be the head of the. What you mean? You had to get her permission? I No, it's not a sense of who wears the pants. It's not a sense of that. But you have to earn the person's respect to be that king or to be that queen. You can't just walk in. I'm the king. I'm the boom. You know, I run this thing. You know, like old people say, you don't run nothing but your shoes. You're about to run that over. So I thank God that I earned the right. A person has you have to get in the hearts of people, just like if you're appointed or elected to pastor a church or you found a church. You may think that I automatically have the respect. Look, what does that button say? You see that button? It says pastor. All right. You remember that. And people think that just because of the position that you have that uh, you all of a sudden merit that respect. You have to earn that respect and get into the hearts of the people. And so that's what I'm sharing with you in regards to my wife. I got into her heart and getting into her heart, she received me as the king of the household. As the, and if my head got too big, she'd say, wait a minute, God is your boss. I remember one time we were having a heated discussion and she said, ooh, can't nobody deal with you. I'm, I, ooh, if I called the bishop, she said, i tell you what. She said, I got you. I'm going to tell God. I said, no, don't tell God. Don't tell God. Because the Bible says that we are to dwell with our wife in peace. And if we don't do that, then what ends up happening, our prayers are going to be hindered. Does that mean that you can never have an ark? Listen, anytime you have two grown folks, and let me share this, you are not going to raise somebody that's grown. My wife and I both have strong, um, strong personalities, very strong personalities. So yes, we go around in circles many times. I remember one time, and I can tell this story because I think we told it before when she, <laughs> she and I were on the uh, line together. And uh, I remember when we first got married, uh, she was going to go and hang with some of her friends. I think it was about 10 o'clock at night. And uh, she said, I'm, I'm heading to, uh, you know, go, go hang out at so-and-so's house. Some of the saints did nothing, no harm or nothing like that. My wife was wholly sanctified woman of God. So nothing bad, but just hang with the saints. But for me, I said, you know, that's not safe. You know, that's that's not safe. This was in Springfield, Missouri, which is a very safe community. But, you know, being the protector, I'm like, no, this isn't this isn't safe. And she was gone. We went around in circles. I said, all right. I went outside and I took uh, one of the cars and put it in front of the other car and took the keys. And I said, now, I said, there's not going to be no going out. She said, you are crazy. I can't believe this man did this. So we would laugh about that particular story. But when you have two individuals um, that have strong personalities, you're going to have disagreements. But that's why you have to have friendship. And I thank God, Lady Hankerson, with an ed educated woman of God, an associate degree, two bachelor's degree, a master's degree, but knew how to be down to earth and knew how to be a friend. And friends are going to have disagreements. They're going to argue. They're going to go back and forth. But the good thing about it, you know, this is not going to be any end. I'm not going any place. You're not going any place. And I thank God. Now, you, you can say that I'm just talking, but I'm telling you, 
for those uh, 23, almost 24 years, we never were separated. We never, uh, I'm staying someplace else, she's staying someplace. God taught us early about that. God taught us early, no, you all stay together. And no matter what happens, you stay together. And I thank God, that's how it happens for friends. Friends are gonna have disagreements, but you have to earn the right to be that queen. You have to earn the right to be that king. You can't demand that. Ephesians 5, 20 through 33, it says, giving thanks always for all things. And you all please hit that share button as well. Hit that share button as well so that other people can be blessed by this. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now, don't get scared of this verse because it's in the Bible. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. <laughs> See, that's the problem right there. That's the problem right there. Now, yeah, a person is abusive. Person talking about throwing a, fi a, a frying pan upside your head. You know, in the old days, we did used to teach no matter what happens, if they hit you upside the head, you got to stay there. You got now, there's some things you don't have to endure. There's some things you don't have to put up with. Someone putting up a frying pan. But if that person has earned that right of respect, I earned the right of respect. And so my wife did not mind saying, let's follow what God gives him let's follow because she would see the fruit of it. And that takes a lot to submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. That takes humility to do that. And of course, we're following the example of Christ when we do that. So he says, uh, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, your own husbands, let's read it right, your own husbands as unto the Lord. So you're not submissive to every man that walks out there and says, ladies, you know, every man that tells you, you got to do it that way. Hold on just a second. It says, submit yourself to your own husbands. For the husband, this is the Bible, is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. That's the covering. Therefore, as the church, and of course, a person that's single, for a lady, your covering, of course, uh, is the Lord. For a man that's single, of course, you don't have a wife or a family to cover, and so you're submitted to the Lord. And you make sure that your life is together. So, I mean, we, we understand what that's saying. Verse 24, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be their own husbands in everything. And again, this is to a man that is submitted to God. And I thank God my wife respected my anointing. She respected my ministry. She respected what God had given me. Now, we were able to differentiate between friendship and ministry because we would have disagreements but then when we got to the house of god we knew hey you know respect that particular role and i remember one time we were going around in circles and everything and i said i'm gonna put you out to church she said, i don't have to go to your church i don't have to listen to you and i mean we went forth and we went back and forth until we just had to laugh at it, it was so funny and i remember one time we had a disagreement i said i bind you in the name of jesus laid hands on on her and then she said i rebuke that devil i bind you in the name of laid hands on me both of us laying hands on each other and finally we just had to fall out laughing because it was the funniest thing here we are both trying to rebuke each other in jesus name so you're going to have those uh disagreements that's the natural side but you have if you don't have respect for each other um then of course it's really hard to have something that's solid and i thank god she was a woman of god that respected the anointing we respected the anointing on each other's life could sing and that's what a lot of people didn't realize a woman of god could sing like you would not believe a lot of people didn't know that there's a clip of her on uh facebook where she's singing calvary and i thank god that we were able to um partner with that scene and um of course the late great bishop rj ward taught us how to set up that scene of calvary and uh, I would tell people, listen, one, one superintendent from Michigan said he almost couldn't take it. Uh, when we set that scene up, he said he just broke down in tears when he, when, when he heard it. And I would share with the people how Jesus was led there to uh, Golgotha's hill and placed on that cross, nails in his hand, nails in his feet. And then my wife would break out with Calvary. Surely he died on Calvary. Wouldn't be a dry ear, dry ear, dry eye in the place could sing under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And so we recognize uh, each other's anointing and had respect and submitted ourselves to the anointing on each other's life. 
it says you, you never knew what time of night you'd have somebody tapping you. She just feel led it whatever time of night, whatever time of day. There's been plenty of days that my kids went to school with greasy heads with that blessed oil, you know, because she's the, the blood cover, the blood cover. Praying woman of God. I remember one morning, Mother, um, I think Mother Yvonne Martin, Mother Yvonne Martin may be on the, uh, may be on the line, but they have a prayer line that they started, and it was early one time. It was early one morning, just about to break a day. I was asleep, but I heard a fight going on, and in my head, I'm thinking, Lord, some somebody's really getting beat up. What is going on? And it was Lady Hangerson wrestling with that devil, wrestling in prayer. But the scripture goes on to say, uh, husband loves your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So we are to nourish and we are to cherish one another. And I thank God that that's the type of wife that I have. These are some lessons coming from her life and things that I observe. Now, when it comes to sex, the Bible says this. Now, listen, God will keep you. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 2. Now, concerning the things whereof he wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. This is Paul speaking from the perspective of his gift of celibacy. He desired that everybody really would be like him. Of course, everyone doesn't have that gift, but that was his desire. But he said, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. Now, if you marry to Susie, then why are you looking all up in Shaniqua's face. Why are you smiling at Shaniqua in a certain kind of way? There's a certain way that we're to carry ourselves as saint of God, not saints of God, not just preachers, but as saints. And let every woman have her own husband. You're already married. Why are you up in somebody else's face? Something is wrong with that. And let me tell you what, since my wife died, I've seen some of everything. I've seen the lightning flashing. I've heard the thunder roar. And in my head, for some people, I'm like, you married. Why are you even looking in this direction, something is wrong with that picture. The Bible says to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. That's a lust spirit is what that is. And let me tell you this, as one that has lived, saved single, saved married, and saved as a widower. Somebody called me single the other day. I said, no such thing. I'm a widower. And that's different from being somebody that is just uh, single, someone that is single is, is, is just not married or has not ever been married, but somebody that's a widower has been married. Let me tell you what, I believe what the Bible says. I'm not just living saved now, you know, just as uh, some kind of example. This is who God made me to be. This is not something new. The Bible says in Jude 24, and I believe it, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Thank you, Jesus and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. I believe in living free from sin. Study Romans chapter six, and it talks about being free from sin. Now, how are we gonna be living dirty in a holiness church? I wish somebody would talk to me in here today. How are we going to uh, live dirty in a holiness church? And I come to tell you, God will keep you, but you have to have a mindset to be kept and you can't play around with fire. If you want to be kept, first of all, definitely have to be saved, definitely sanctified, but baptized in the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about really filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm not talking about just made up tongues because people just make up tongues. I'm talking about filled and living a consecrated well. Hankerson, I'm not Jesus. Yeah, we're not Jesus, but I believe what the word says. I believe what God's word says that God will keep you. And God kept me before marriage. He's keeping me, he kept me in marriage and he's keeping me right now. And he will do the same thing for you. He kept my wife before marriage. He kept her in marriage and he kept her until she went on to glory to be with the Lord. First Thessalonians 4, verses three through four. Somebody's getting mad, but going to get, get mad till you get glad. I don't have no friends when I'm teaching the word of God. I don't care who it is. Well, so and so, I don't care who it is. I believe what God's word says, because because there's people that I've heard say, well, that's just an act. Ain't nobody live that saved. You mean to tell, you know what? Let me tell you something. Let me get it right here. Got to watch how I turn. I don't want to fall down. What, what, what does the songwriter say? The Bible is right and somebody's wrong. Hallelujah. First Thessalonians 4, 3 through 4 says, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification that ye should abstain from fornication, 
that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. I believe as people of God, again, we're to carry ourselves in a respectful manner. And the reason why people are looking at us, people are watching us and they're following our example. And the church makes so many excuses and then complains about scandals. Let me say it again. The church makes so many <laughs> excuses and then complains about scandal. People say things like, oh, nobody is perfect. Everybody has skeletons. Everybody has faults. We can't judge anybody. All of us are human. All of us have something going on. And then when somebody messes up, oh, they should know better. They should know better. That's supposed to be a preacher. That's supposed to be a man. Now, you can't have it both ways. You, you can't have it both ways. Either it's one way or the other. And I believe the scriptures are right. Even people try to ask these questions. The Bible said, be holy for I'm, well, what does it mean to be holy? To be consecrated. That's what it means. It means to be consecrated. It means to be separated unto God and consecrated for his service. And either we're going to have a mind to live right or not. Now, if I want to be a sinner, I just go out on the way. If I'm, I'm going to say we had, a, we had a gentleman in our church in uh, Springfield. We used to call him Uncle Henry. And he used to say, if you're going to be a devil, then be a good devil. You're going to be a saint, then be a saint. Now, you want to live dirty and all of that, well, you might as well just be a devil is one or the other. I like the song say, I like living this kind of life. We that's Clark sisters. I love living this kind of life. I love living a sanctified and a holy life. And I had a wife that loved, I'm talking about pure and holy and righteousness. And she would say in a minute, if it's not about right, if it's not about God, then I don't want to have anything to do with it. It would grieve her so much when she would see people portray one thing and then do something else but she reverence a life of holiness. She, she, I'm going to make you laugh on this one. She would tell me, yeah, you all holy and all that, but just mean as you can be. <laughs> she, she would say that, but, you know, it's important. Hankerson, you may, listen, listen, I'm just type of individual. Hankerson's are like that. We just don't like a whole lot of foolishness. We, we can't stand a lot of foolishness. I even have to get after my son, um, Matthew. You know, he's got that, that mean streak in him. We were at an event one time. And, uh, you know, people are eating. This was like a banquet event. And somebody called, hey, glory, you know, Honda, ha, ba, 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 all, all of that. And Matt's face turned up. I said, Matt, straighten up your face. He said, I ain't feeling nothing. That's <laughs> I said, you don't know. I ain't feeling nothing. That's just show. And that's irritating. You know, so Hankersons are, are very, you know, just, just cut and dry. Of course, I've learned how to be palatable and, and, and all of that. But uh, don't like a lot of foolishness at all. My wife's family is the same way. McCain's and Hankerson's are very similar. They don't like a lot of foolishness. Sit there and look at you. Uh, strange if you're just about foolishness. But listen, if either we're going to be saved or we're not. If you're going to be a devil, be a devil. If you're going to be saved, be saved. 1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 20 says this. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts and members of Christ? So should I take a part of Christ and join him to a prostitute? Never. And don't you know, <laughs> Sister Natalie Smith said, Matt is my twin. Yeah, he's my, because sometimes I get so mad at the kids. What's wrong with you all? They said, well, we're just like you. I said, I'm not like that. They said, we're just like you. I said, God help me. And that's what my wife would say. She said, yeah, you all, you all holy and all, but just me. Uh, so <laughs> The Bible says in verse 16, 1 Corinthians 6, I'm reading from the Living Bible. And don't you know that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, she becomes a part of him and he becomes a part of her. For God tells us in the scripture that in his sight, the two become one person. But if you give yourself to the Lord, you and Christ are joined together as one person. That is why I say to run from sex sin. No other sin affects the body as this one does. When you sin this sin, it is against your own body. Haven't you learned that your body is the home of the Holy Spirit God gave you and that he lives within you? Your own body does not belong to you, for God has bought you with a great price. So use every part of your body to give glory back to God because he owns it. That's 1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 20. And we're dealing with um, sex right now. We're on that part. We're dealing with love, marriage. Now we're dealing with, with sex. 
And a lot of times people will tell you, abstain from fornication, abstain from adultery, abstain from homosexuality, abstain from this and that and the other. But why? The reason why is because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body is the temple of God. And you don't want to take God's temple and join it in sexual sin. And uh, somebody may think that, well, you know, God, the Bible, I heard one preacher say this, and this was kind of individual. He, he was a dirty preacher, just a nasty preacher. Just, you know, I was young and naive. I saw him leaving out with somebody one time from a convention. It wasn't his wife and he had a certain look on his face. I'm just thinking, oh, okay, maybe that's one of the members of the church and they're going to handle some church. And oh yeah, they're going to handle some business, all right. And all of that uh, came out in regard to his um, life and the way that he was living. But one of the things he would say is whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. So you can't judge me. That was his mentality. And look at what's going on now. I know we went to an extreme at one time that everything was wrong, but now it seems like everything is right. Everything is not right. But I'm telling you, God has a remnant. And this type of message may not be popular, but thank you, Rachel, for your life. Thank you for your dedication. Thank you for your consecration as a woman of God. And we stand on that biblical principle of a consecrated and a sanctified life. Like I said, I see all kinds of people do all kinds of things. Let me tell you something, preachers. Let me tell you something, saints. Let me tell you something, evangelists. People will try to trap you. But that's why I thank God for the Holy Ghost. I, I've told this story before. Uh, bless you, Bishop Howard. I told I told um, this story. Bless you, Elder Brown. I told this story before. Um, matter of fact, the wife and I both told this story. I was uh, that was when our church was located on Virginia Avenue um, here in the city of St. Louis. I was heading to the church um, daily at six o'clock for prayer, and I told my wife um, one morning. This was one morning. I just felt that I said, "Come, come with me to prayer." Huh? Huh? You know, what, what, I'm not prepared. I mean, I get come now and see. That's where that wives submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord, submitting yourself one to another. My wife knew there was a certain way I could say something, and she'd be like, "All right." You know, that's why you have to you have to be in sync. You have to be in sync, and we were in sync that. And even my, my whole my whole family knows that now. My whole not now, they just always knew it. There's a certain way that he says something. If he's saying something a certain way, it's for a reason. He may not explain it. Most time he's not gonna explain it. But there's a certain reason why he's saying that. And so this is because it would take almost an hour to get to Virginia Avenue from our uh house. That was a long ways, almost um, you know, an hour away. So you're leaving at five o'clock in the morning to get to church at, at, at six, we get there. My wife knew when I said come, and it wasn't that, it wasn't that anything was going on, but I just felt led, she didn't come. And sure enough, get to the church, there's a knock on the door. And who is at the door, but one of the former <laughs> members of the church in a mini skirt, and fishnet stockings at six o'clock in the morning. More, the, 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 from what I understand, the lady wouldn't even roll over in bed till 12 noon. And here you go, I heard the pastor having prayer at six o'clock in the morning. So I'm the one who went to open the door. Praise the Lord, sister so-and-so, so good to see you. Come on in, come on in, walk in, turns that corner, because we had a, you walk in the uh, vestibule, you turn the corner, going to the sanctuary of Virginia Avenue, turn the corner, there's Lady Hankerson, praise the Lord, sister so-and-so, had egg all over her face. See, the Holy Ghost, hallelujah, will tell you, watch this one, watch that one, people will try to set you up in all kinds of ways, folks try to do it now, but I thank God that I'm baptized and filled. See, when you fill with the Holy Ghost, you don't have an appetite for sin. Sin is nothing to play with, saints. Sin is nothing to play with. And I know most people on here are believers. If you're an unbeliever, you need to come out of your sins. I'm going to share with you in a few minutes a story on how you can come out of your sins. But sin is nothing to play with. Sexual sin is nothing to play with. That sin will get all in your spirit. It will get all within your heart. And I thank God 
for keeping me. Now, again, my testimony, Lady Hankerson's testimony may be different from a lot of people. God kept us pure before marriage, during marriage, after marriage. He's keeping me right now. Now unto him that's able to keep you from falling. There may be others that say, Hankerson, I don't have that testimony. I've been uh, it was some time up, some time down, sometime almost level to the ground. Well, I tell you what, you can share with individuals how they can avoid those types of experiences and how they can allow God to keep them. But yeah, you have things that happen. I had something happen recently. I was in travel and um, of course the, the, the place I was preaching at was somewhat of a distance from the airport. And so um, for that particular organization, I'll be just as kind of um, somewhat vague, but somewhat specific, because people always try to figure out what you're talking about, who you're talking about. But anyways, I show up in this particular city, plain lands. The adjutant is there to drive me uh, to the city that I have to preach in for this um, particular organization. So we show up at the hotel. We show up at the hotel. Now, while we're driving, we're talking about the Lord, and I'm just talking about you know, the gentleman is asking me questions. A lot of times people ask me questions. Well, you know, how do you do this? How do you do that? How did you get to where you are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so anyways, um, we're having a high old time and I'm, I'm about to stop the car, stop the car, because I feel like shouting. You know, I may not have much of a step now, but I feel like shouting. So finally, we get to uh, the place where he's to drop me off at the hotel. And district missionary like, we get to the hotel, get to the front desk. And so we get there and the lady at the front desk um, say, your name's Hankerson? I say, yeah. Oh, there was a woman here looking for you. And so the adjutant looks at me like, oh, that's a Hankerson role. And I'm looking at him like, man, Niger, is this some kind of setup? I got to say it a certain way on, but you you know what I mean when I say Niger. N not Niger? <laughs> It, it, this must be some kind of setup. So we're both looking at each other. And so then the lady says, oh, it was somebody here from the um, church here to bring a basket. I said, oh, I said, I tell you what, I said, how it is, nobody brings anything to my room. That does not happen. If you got a basket, leave it at the front desk. I don't need no visitation. People will set you up. I went to preach one place one time and it went to the first service to preach that I think it was a two or three day revival, came back and so the church had ordered supposed to be a fruit gap basket for me. And um, uh, uh, <laughs> Elder Brown got in there, big old bottle of wine. I said, what is this? Somebody said, Angerson, you should have let, no, uh-uh. I'm saved and sanctified and filled. Well, it ain't no sin. Listen, listen, to be holiness, this is an ascetic faith. And an ascetic faith, we can do what everybody else can do. Other people may can get away with it. We can't get away with it because God requires a certain standard. I, well, you just religious. Well, call me religious. Thank God for being religious. If being consecrated and being ascetic and being dedicated is well, you, you just all these deep folks. Take take me down deeper. Take me as deep in Jesus as I can get. I don't want to be as far away as I can. Tell me how far away can I be and still be safe? Take me down deeper. Take me higher and call me deep. Call me religious. I don't mind. I've been called that. My wife and I, both of us, have been called religious. But I said, no, get this, get this junk out of here. Uh-uh. That's just what people want. Uh-huh. He's both be sanctified and up there. This And then people lose respect for you. My wife had a good name. A good name is to be treasured above riches, above positions, and above honor. The, the position doesn't make you. You make the position. You make it something respectable. You make it something that people can respect and look up to. You know, I'm I'm this and that and the other. So all the you, you know, man of God, just because you have a certain position, that doesn't make you ain't knowing it just because you got a certain office. Your life has to help make that office respectable. So going back to this story, the lady said, Oh, it was somebody bringing a basket. And so, of course, I tell Jim and I said, I said, you know, Niger, is this, you know, you don't play? No, 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 no. I said, I said, OK. So then the lady goes into something else. She starts saying, all right, how many room keys is it going to be? And, and uh, uh, how many beds? I said, hold up. Just, I just got vexed in my spirit. I said, I'm the only one staying at this hotel. I don't roll like that. She said, oh, well, you all seem like respectable men. Anyway, if we seem like respectable men, why are you even acting like that? 
And so I told the preacher, I said, you know what? The reason that lady was being so messy is because being, Lord show me, being in this hotel business, she's seen so many people that's supposed to be preachers coming in, doing in some of everything and thinking that they're not being watched and people are looking at their life. And so she was testing to see, is this a real man of God or not? So please understand the enemy and people will set traps for you. But if you have the Holy Ghost, he will lead God and direct you. My final few minutes here, I want to thank God for all of you. God bless each and every one of you for chiming in. Again, I'm sharing some uh, principles from the life of Lady Rachel Hankerson. You can go online and you can see her, um, where well, you call it obituary, but I say biography of the great things that she accomplished in life. She was a um, she was an entrepreneur, um, homemaker, evangelist, gospel singer, um, parent, best friend, wife. And I thank God, Sister Jackson, that I'm able to sit here and share this with you all without having a, you know, conniption fit. I still have my fits. So let's talk about grief. I still have my uh, fits, but I know how to, you know, try to keep it together most of the time because you, as a leader, you can't come unglued in front of people all the time. Now you have to show your human side. Jesus wept. But if you're just sitting there all the time, you know, you, 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 you cause the people to be disheartened. You cause the people to be discouraged. Well, Lord, if he can't make it, I don't know whether you're going to help me or not. And so sometimes we just have to grin. Well, Hankerson, I'm just keeping it real. No, when you're a leader, you're held to a higher. So I think we no, when you're a leader and you can tell me otherwise, but at 50 years old, you're not going to change me at this age. Now, a leader is held to a higher standard because you're an example to the people. You know, and, and you find that principle in the Old Testament where it came to the priesthood. You find that in the New Testament where Paul lays out those requirements for those that are in church leadership. So you're held to a standard to be an example to the people. Everyone is required to live right. Everyone. If I can't sin, you can't sin. If I can't do things like, and listen, my family will tell you this. This is one thing that we know in our household. Lady Hankerson believed in it and taught it. I believe in it and teach it. We make no excuses for nobody. If I sin and act up and mess up with God, I'm going to bust hell wide open. It doesn't matter anything about it. If, 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 if it's the, the, the whoever, I'll just say it like that, whoever, there, there is no excuse. And again, that's why I say when I'm teaching the word, there are no friends. There are no friends. God's word is right. And we have to come up to the standards of the word and not change the standards of the word to suit us. I know this is not popular now and again. You know, people say this is being deep or being religious, but I tell you what, it's worked 50 years and it's going to work however longer that God has me on the face of this earth. And so my wife went into glory. The Lord told me she's all right. And not only that, and speaking about grief now, not only did he tell me uh, she's all right, he said, I'm not ready for you now. And so I'm here for a few years. But when it comes to grief, Proverbs 27 and 1 says, never brag about what you will do in the future. You have no idea what tomorrow will bring. Well, you need to grieve this way. You need to listen. You don't know what kind of predicament that you are going to get in. I've ministered to grieving people for many, many years of ministry. But when you are in that shoe yourself, you find out that a lot of times you're telling people, oh, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. But when you have to do it, and let me tell you what. We're in a time now. Let me read to you what the Bible says, Matthew 24 and 8. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pains. I'm reading from the Amplified. King James says the beginning of sorrows, of the intolerable anguish and time of unprecedented trouble. I know everybody's talking about, oh, things are just going to be wonderful and hunky-dory and all of the wonderful things that are coming our way. That's not what he's showing me. What he's showing me is that we haven't learned our lesson. We haven't learned our lesson. He's allowed all kind of things to happen and we've been stiff necked and hard hearted and unruly and ungodly and unholy haven't changed behavior and it's just like when the children of is not even just behavior but the inside haven't repented just going on his business as usual that's not what he's giving me but everything just gonna be what he what he showed me is that every house is going to be touched in some kind of matter what are you going to do when the destroyer comes through? Every house is going to be touched. He said it's like the children of Israel when he brought them out of 
Egypt and was going to take them into the promised land. And they had hardness of heart and disbelief. He said, turn around and go on back into the wilderness. You're going to go around in circles all these particular years. Judgment is in the land. And when I say in the land, if you're watching any, well, let me run someplace. Let me run to Europe. It's going to be over there. Let me run to Asia. It's going to be over there. Let me run to Antarctica. It's going to be over there. The Bible says these are the beginning of sorrows. When you read the prophets that we've been studying about, God said, all these folks telling you it's going to be okay. And it's going to be okay as far as our relationship with God, as far as the anointing, as far as what God does in the church. He said, I haven't sent these people. And my wife, before she left here, I, I can't stand to see the message now. If Mother McCain is on here, we'll try to um, share it kind of when I'm able to, to handle it. But her last sermon at Life Center was on Mother's Day 2021. And her words were this, and she looked totally different. We did, because I had came to church early. And when she came in, I said, you know, what, what's going on? You could tell something was, was wrong, but she got up to bring that Mother's Day message. And she said, I'm telling you, something is coming that's gonna be like you've never experienced before. And she went into details in regard to that. Before she left here, her prophetic ministry was, um, to, you know, when people are getting ready to go into eternity, that woman of God in the hospital, and we'd even stayed at a hotel close to the uh, hospital for a few days. Thank God for the, the, Saint, the Saints of Life Center. Just, I, I couldn't make it without the Saints of Life Center. They've just been tremendous, extraordinary. I'm, I'm here because of the Saints of Life Center, all, all people around the world. Yes, but I thank God for my local church. I don't grieve about my local oh, I got to go. Sometimes I hold them so long today. <laughs> today I was holding them so long. They're shutting the heat off, shutting the microphones off, shutting the organ off and everything. I bet he'll shut up now if we shut this off. I said, that's okay. Y'all gonna get it for that. But I love being around the, the saints. They took care of us. But there was a couple times she spoke in tongues 48 hours straight. Spoke in tongues so till at the hospital. And that's a whole different ball of drama there. Um, they were writing up her daily report and said she's having some type of neurological issue because she's doing something with her tongue. And I had to explain, hallelujah, glory to God. She's saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. She's speaking in other tongues is what she's doing. And God showed her all kinds of things that were to come. And she gave that warning that there is, and this is not a prophecy lesson, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I'll do that maybe another time. But a lot of these terrible things are going to happen. So when it comes to grief, be careful how you run down somebody else. Again, I've had people say, Hankerson's crazy. Uh, he's not in his right mind. He's not able to function because of the loss of his wife. And yada. you always have naysayers like that. You have to hear and know. When you're in ministry, you have to have thick skin. But be very careful how you talk because you don't know what may come towards your household. Now, somebody may say, well, I want God to come and take my spouse. Oh, he knows how to get your attention now. He knows how to get your attention. Here's what's helped me. Proverbs 17, 22. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. And I thank God that Lady Hankerson was a person of joy. Um, she enjoyed life to the fullest. As I close, we traveled everywhere. My wife went to all the lower 48 states. We saw all the great sites in the U.S., the Golden Gate Bridge, the um, Liberty Bell, Mount Rushmore, um, you name it, all the states. Um, of course, you didn't make it to Alaska and Hawaii, but all 48 states, many countries we traveled to, and she was able to enjoy those things. She enjoyed life. She enjoyed the basic things of life, just sitting up looking at the stars and just looking at the um, planets through the telescope and through the various apps that you can get on your phone. And so I would encourage anyone that's broken during this time to have that same type of excitement about life that she had. She would, and, and, and she and my um, kids, even my kids tell me that now, because I'm, I'm, I'm not, the, you know, I was brought up, y'all told me it was a sin to laugh. And so, you know, I have a dry sense of humor and it's coming out more and more. You know, but I had a sense of humor, but the saints made it so like you're going to hell if you laugh. And so sometimes she would try to play around. Don't play. Don't play. This is it. She said, that's your problem. You're just too serious. Like I said, she said, you're holy, but just mean, mean as you can be. 
It's no, this is serious. They said everything is not serious. Just just enjoy some things. And so it's important for those of you that are broken and hurt it, hurt it, hurting and wounded that you enjoy life, that you make the most of life. And that's what she did. Now, there's somebody here today. You're not getting too much out of life because you don't know Jesus. Oh, I'm getting everything. I, oh, I drive good. I eat good. I dress good. Let me tell you what. You are the walking dead if you don't know Jesus. My wife knew the Lord, and I believe that she went into the presence of the Lord. The Lord showed me um, many things in regard to death before my wife actually passed. And I didn't realize why he was doing it, but now I see why. Um, for example, one time I was laying in the bed. And God said, I'm going to show you what it's like to die. And I could feel my spirit leaving my body. In the month of August of 2020, she and I were riding on a plane. We dealt enough with the pandemic. We said, we got to go somewhere. And so we were riding on the uh, plane. I actually died. I was gone. I remember telling her, um, hey, can you get me my seven up? That's at the bottom of the seat. That's all I remember. And then I opened up my eyes and I looked. And there's all these light people. Y'all kind of get what I say when I'm saying it. all these light people are turning around staring me in the face. And I'm looking like, what kind of mess is this? Why are these people staring at me? Folks are standing all in the aisle. The person that was next to me, he's gone. And I look at my wife. Her face is as red as this can be. I'm like, what's, what's going on? She said, you were gone. I said, gone? What do you mean? She said, you were gone. And so one of the gentlemen in the uh, uh, aisle was saying they were trying to Get somebody that knew how to do CPR. They were about to do CPR on me. I was gone. They couldn't find a pulse. And uh, I said, Rachel, what did you do? She said, I called Jesus and said everybody else was calling Jesus. I said, you don't, them light people, you probably scared them half to death not knowing what was going on. But I told her this. I said, you should have left me where I was at. I said, it was a peace like you just can't imagine. I felt that peace coming too. I didn't know about leaving here or anything like that, but I knew I had this peace. Imagine everything in your life is really so focused on your body, sickness, feeding your body, working for shelter, having to transport it. it. It wants to go to sleep. It wants to stay up, all those kind of things. Imagine all of those worries being completely gone. I do know that, that when I came to, I felt like something had happened where there was this experience where there was total peace. She would not come back if she desired to. She can't come back to me, but I tell you what, I can go and I can be with her where she is at. No, in the resurrection, there is no marriage or giving in marriage. And I have the saints laughing all the time. I said, I, I at least want to say hello to her, you know, and um, I have the saints laughing. I said, I will shut heaven down, you know, come and see her. Do I know you? What you mean, dude? We had three children. Yeah, we were married almost 24 years. What you mean? I'll shut it down. They'll be like, what happened? There's nobody going to heaven and nobody coming out of heaven. Some crazy man up there hollering at, you know, telling this lady that he was married. Send him downstairs. Send me downstairs. I'll turn that air condition on uh, down there. So I have the saints laughing when I talk about that. But I tell you what, will you meet me there? Will you meet me in that city? So bright and fair. Will you meet me when we see him face to face? Can you imagine what that's going to be like, saints of God? Seeing, I want to see Rachel again. I want to see all of the loved ones that have gone into eternity. And, um, you know, there's the argument about, you know, are you conscious after you die? Is there soul sleep? Whatever it is, I want to see Jesus. That's what I want to see. And if you don't know him in the parting of your sins, you need to stop what you do. I'm driving, Hankerson. Pull over to the side of the road. I'm on a bridge. Get past the bridge and pull over to the side of the road. Find a parking lot someplace. It's that important. What does it profit you to gain the whole world and die and lose your soul? In the next few minutes, you're going to pray a prayer that is going to change and alter the total course of your life forever. The next two minutes are going to be the most important minutes of your life because I'm sharing you with you right now that Jesus died for you. He gave his life for you. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The word says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Out of all of the principles that can come forth from the life of this awesome woman of God that was born 49 years ago today, the greatest legacy, and we're going to continue that legacy, the greatest legacy 
is for some lost soul to come to Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. The Bible talks about the blood of Abel, that he being dead, yet speaketh. Now the body may be in the grave, and spirit back with God, but you can't take away the testimony that this woman lived for God and lived a life of consecration, dedication, and separation, and holiness, and asceticism unto God. Receive him now as your Lord and Savior. Pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and you were buried in the grave. Three days later, God the Father raised you from the dead. Ask him to say, right now, Lord, I ask you for, to forgive me for all the wrong that I've been and the wrong that I have done. Come into my heart. I open to you the door of my heart and I receive you into my heart as my personal Lord and as my Savior. Lord Jesus, come on, ask him that now. Say, Lord Jesus, fill me with the Holy Ghost. Come on, tell him, I want that Holy Ghost that the preacher talked about tonight. Fill me now, whether it's in your car, whether it's in your home, whether it's in your living room. Say, fill, hey, 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 glory. Say, fill me now with the gift of the Holy Ghost. I receive and I thank you for my salvation. I just begin to thank him. Just begin to clap those hands. The Bible said, clap your hands, O ye people, and shout unto God with the voice of triumph and thanksgiving. The Holy Ghost comes into a glad heart. He'll fill you right now. Some, hey, some of you need to be refilled. I'm trying not to talk that language, but I feel it rising up. Because he said, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Let God fill you right now. Let God refresh you right now. So, Lord Jesus, I pray for everyone that has heard this teaching based on the word of God, from the word of God, founded on the word of God. But this lesson inspired by the light of this awesome woman of God that has gone before us. I thank you for the privilege of being married to her for close to 24 years. And thank you for that legacy and that example that God, we will never allow to diminish or allow to go out because there's so many people that need to receive this foundational teaching on how to live for you. I pray for every believer to be refilled. I pray for every pastor and preacher that heard the challenge of this message, God, to live a consecrated life for you. We thank you, dear God, that you're keeping us in these last and evil days. Bless your people now. We will bless you. We'll live for you. We'll run on because we know what the end's going to be. We'll run on because we're believing you to make 100 because 99 and a half won't do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all the people said Amen. As we close, since we started off with the YPWW pledge, it's not YPWW, but since we kind of feel in that particular manner, and please don't forget to um, share this, this, this lesson with someone right now. As we close, let's do Jude 24 and 25. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Let all the people say, Amen. Join me in the morning, 6 o'clock. We're reading through the scriptures. And uh, this coming Tuesday night, I have another live lesson that I'm going to share with you, a very significant lesson. So join me live Tuesday night at 6 o'clock. Every day, 6 a.m. Central Standard Time for the reading of the word of God. By the end of the year, we should be done with the entire Old Testament. And by the end of January, can you believe in six months, we will be done with the entire uh, Bible. Anderson, you read so fast. Well, you know, um, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. We'll just say thank the Lord. But we're going through and uh, we have some other plans to share with you. That's not going to be the end. That's just the beginning. We're going to go through until Jesus returns. So God bless your heart as you leave. Don't forget to turn around because every time we turn around, God is blessing us. You have a wonderful day and evening is my prayer. God bless.